Good afternoon. Everybody see and hear me? Good. Welcome uh, to EEOC. Welcome to our Macy Brown Bag, brought to you by the Office of Federal Operations uh, Training and Outreach D Division. My name is Joe Linda Johnson, and I am happy to see so many faces here, and I'm happy to have all of you folks who are streaming out there uh, within EEOC, and for those of you who will view this later, hello from the recording. We are thrilled to have uh, with us a panel of experts to talk about uh, OFO's, or the Commission's actually, recent Macy decision. Uh, hopefully everyone had a chance to look at the decision prior to the brown bag. We hope you brought all of your intense, hard-hitting questions. These folks like when you make them nervous, so, you know, <laughs> put them on the spot. Nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Except for Dan. Uh, uh, we welcome your questions. The intent of this program is to just give you a brief overview of the decision and actually the panel will likely touch on two or three decisions that sort of led us up to uh, the Macy decision. There has been a progression over the last year, uh, a quick progression which is so rare for the commission but we're pleased <laughs> to have it. Um, so they're going to briefly talk to you about the decision, uh, Macy, as well as an appellate brief that was filed a while ago uh, by our Office of General Counsel and two other OFO decisions that preceded Macy. Uh, we're not going to have the panelists give you a full sort of PowerPoint presentation as for those of you who have attended brown bags in the past, you know that's not our style. What we prefer to do is have a brief discussion and then we open it up to the floor and we expect you to participate and ask lots of questions and, part and uh, get the discussion going. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you our panelists. First to my immediate left we have Commissioner Heifel Bloom uh, who was integral in the issuance of this decision. To her left is Dan Vale, who is an acting uh, assistant, Atter assistant general counsel in our Office of General Counsel. He's going to talk about implementation on the private sector side of these decisions. And then to Dan's left is Melissa Brand, who is an appellate attorney in the Office of Federal Operations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Just a few ground rules before we get started. Uh, as Commissioner Fe Feldblum already mentioned, please turn your cell phones off or at the very least on vibrate. Uh, number two, is there anybody in the room who needs an interpreter? The interpreter will stick around for maybe the first five or ten minutes. Uh, if there is a need, uh, he will stay, and if there's not, we're going to release him. So if you need him, please raise your hand and let us know. Number three, we do invite questions from the audience, but as I mentioned at the outset, this is being recorded, therefore all questions must be on the mic. That means you must get up from your chair, go to the mic on either side of the room, uh, we'll, if we can, we'll try and pass mics, but please don't raise your hand from your seat and just shout it out. It won't be picked up by the mic and we'll ask you to start again. So, again, every question must be on the mic, okay? Before we get start, uh, other uh, housekeeping items, bathrooms, if you need them, are out the glass doors that you came into and keep straight past the elevators and they're on either side of the elevators. And in the event of an emergency, go out the glass doors, take an immediate left and another immediate left, and you will go outside of our south lobby. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Feldblum. Great, thank you. Um, so number one, those folks all the way over there, you might want to, if you want to, you can come move here, because I'm going to stand here, but um, you might not be able to see Melissa and Dan as well if these guys are going to talk from here. Um, I see there was a huge move. Okay. Um, <laughs> number two, sort of as you heard from Jolinda, um, a huge piece of this is to be able to have the back and forth Q&A. So we are leaving a full 45 minutes for that. Okay, this thing goes from 12 to 1.30. We're going to be finished with our opening comments. Our goal is at quarter to one. So each of us just talking for about 10, 12 minutes and then opening up for questions. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with a brief overview of the decision and basically what the decision means in terms of Title VII law. Now, as you know, for the federal sector, for employees in the federal sector, um, they're governed by a provision of Title VII that's different from the provision that governs the private sector. But in both of those sections, it says you may not be discriminated against on the basis of sex, right, because of sex. And so in the Macy decision, we start with noting the section that applies to federal employees and then also note the one from Title VII and then proceed along using a lot of Title VII case law. And as you can imagine, 
that's one of the reasons why the decision in Macy applies not only to federal employees, and Melissa Brand from Office of Federal Operations will be talking about that, but also to anyone who comes to any EEOC office across the country, right? From anyone who works for an employer with more than 15 employees or who works for a state or local government um, um, entity. And that's why Daniel Vale, who's here from our Office of General Counsel, is going to be talking a bit about how that will play out in terms of those offices. Okay, so the law. The law is actually stunningly simple. But it's one of those things where, because of how I think, personally, social norms have evolved so much more over the past 10 years, something that was stunningly simple as a matter of law and wasn't perceived by the courts in the 1970s were then, was then perceived by the courts in the 1990s and early 2000s. So in one sense, this Macy decision is like ho-hum, the EEOC agency sort of catching up to what a bunch of courts had already been saying about coverage of transgender people under Title VII. On the other hand, it's a pretty landmark decision I think because it highlights, in a way, how simple and easy the law is. So to explain that, we're going to do a little whirlwind um, historical um, tour of sex discrimination law. Okay, so Congress passes the act in 1964. Obviously, the significant pressure for passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the horrendous discrimination against black people in this country. So obviously it says you cannot discriminate based on race, color, national origin, religion. Sex gets added to the bill on the House side because there was also a lot of sex discrimination going on. And so sex gets added. You cannot discriminate based on sex. And again, because of the discrimination that was happening against women. Early on, in some cases, when a guy brought a lawsuit because he felt he was being discriminated against because of being a man, and the courts were like, huh, a men covered? Well, it says because of sex. It doesn't say we're protecting women. It says because of sex. So early on, it's like, yeah, men are covered. Well, so early on in the 70s, some gay people brought cases and said, hey, you're discriminating against me because of sex, right? Because of the sex of the person that I'm attracted to. That's why you're discriminating against me. And some transgender people brought cases and said, you're discriminating against me because of sex, because I'm now changing my sex, right? When I was changing, you're perceiving me um, in terms of I was born a biological man, I have now transitioned, I'm a woman, that's clearly because of sex. Now the courts could have said right then, yeah, you're right, that's because of sex. But they didn't. They were like, are you kidding? No. They said, you're not covered, and they had two reasons. They said when Congress used the word sex, Congress meant women and men. You know, by then it was also clearly men, but it's just women. So if you're discriminating against women because they're women or men because they're men, that's covered. So one was the meaning of the word sex. And the other thing they said is, well, that's clearly not what Congress intended. You'd now be like covering this whole new class of people that Congress didn't intend. So those were the two main reasons. So that was it. Then, you know, those cases stopped being bringing, stopping being bringing, those cases stopped being brought. Um, and you had, for example, the effort to pass the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which is still going on. Then in 1989, the Supreme Court in Price Waterhouse decides a case brought by a woman who was a very sort of masculine looking woman, um, very aggressive, very didn't wear makeup, didn't, you know, trying to become a partner at Price Waterhouse. She doesn't become a partner, and there's stuff in the record that says, well, you know, if she wore makeup more, or, you know, went to charm school, or was just more feminine, you know, maybe that would be better. And the Supreme Court says, that is a violation of Title VII if you are acting based on gender stereotypes, okay? That if a woman has to act a certain way in order to get ahead, or a man has to act in a certain way in order to get ahead, that's gender stereotyping, and that's a violation of Title VII. Now, what was interesting, and again, what I think one of the things we brought out in this case is, as the concurrence in that case noted, gender stereotyping was not an independent claim. Gender stereotyping was evidence 
that gender was being taken into account, that gender was mattering in some way in that employment decision. It's what we used to call in our office when in working on this, if gender's on the brain, that's not good. Unless this specifically gender is a bona fide occupational qualification. You have to be a woman for this job, or you have to be a man for this job. So for example, one of the things that the, we note in the Macy decision is, we say Title VII does identify one circumstance in which an employer may take gender into account in making an employment decision, namely when gender is a BFOQ, which is very narrow, the only plausible inference to draw from this provision is that in all other circumstances, a person's gender may not be considered in making decisions that affect her. Okay? In all decisions, gender may not be taken into account. Okay, so that's what the Supreme Court said in 1989 in Price Waterhouse. So gender doesn't just mean men and women, but when you're taking gender into account, and one way to note that gender is being taken into account, if you're operating based on a gender stereotyping, gender stereotype, like a woman shouldn't be aggressive, or a man shouldn't be effeminate. Okay. That's 1989. 1998, almost 10 years later, Supreme Court decides the case of Ancal. Ancal was a case of same-sex sexual harassment, right? A sort of effeminate guy on an oil rig, all guys on the oil rig being harassed, the Supreme Court says, written by opinion by Justice Scalia, if this person was being harassed based on sex, right, experiencing the same type of sexual harassment that way too many women experience in the world today, that can be a violation of Title VII. And as Justice Scalia wrote, the fact that the 1964 Congress wasn't thinking about same-sex sexual harassment doesn't matter. It's the words of the statute that govern not the intent of the initial legislature, right? Because sometimes you can put out a word in a, in a law and it actually ends up covering additional things because that's what's covered under those words. And if the legislature doesn't like what, how it's being interpreted, the legislature can always come back and change it, okay? But we are, as Justice Scalia wrote, we are governed by the words of the statute. That was 1998. So then based on those two cases, transgender folks who were bringing cases in court started winning more based on gender stereotyping. And the Ninth Circuit, the Sixth Circuit, and then the Eleventh Circuit all ruled, in fact, that a transgender person could bring a claim using gender stereotyping. So now we get to the Macy case. In Macy, Macy versus Holder, a person, a woman, applied for a job while she was still a man. She was incredibly qualified for this particular weapons ballistic you know, system. Talked to the director of the lab in California. She was moving to California. Director is like, Psh, you sound pretty good. You know, you gotta go through the background checks. As she goes through the background checks, sort of towards the end, she tells the contractor who's doing this hiring that she has now transitioned and she's now Mia Macy. Two days later, she gets, uh, three days later, she gets an email from the contractor that actually the job is no longer open. She goes, she's an applicant. She goes to the DOJ counselor. And again, you know, counselors do different amount of sort of work. They don't, they're not the ones doing the investigation, but this counselor did a fair amount. So there were, you know, emails back and forth that it just seems that the, that's what the lab wanted to do. But in fact, the lab did hire someone else on the grounds that that person was further along in the background check. Now, one key thing for you to note about the Macy decision is we, the commission, did not rule on whether discrimination occurred in this case. Okay, this was not a case that came up to us on the facts of has discrimination occurred. It came up purely on a jurisdictional matter. Because when she filed her complaint, she checked off sex and wrote gender identity, transgender, you know, and DOJ is one of those agencies that had these two systems set in place. One, the 1614 EEOC system, and the other, a system for transgender sexual orientation. Again, an understandable thing. I mean, EEOC ended up doing one of those as well a few years ago. Um, 
one of the things this decision should now make clear is anyone who is transgender should be going through the 1614 process. Anyone who is gay who can argue that gender was taken into account should be permitted to go through the 1614 process, okay? Because what it's saying is if gender has been taken into account, that can be a violation of Title VII. So, but in any event, DOJ separated <coughs> it into these two claims and then various other machinations, uh, but, but said very clearly, EOC doesn't have jurisdiction to deal with gender stereotyping transgender issues under Title VII. So that was the purely legal question that came to the commission. That is the purely legal question that the commission has answered. And the way that the commission has answered, and I will end with this before I pass along. So we, we basically go through some of the cases. As I said, one of the main things that we did that I don't think has been done in the courts as clearly is not only explain that someone can bring this claim based on gender stereotyping, but can also just bring this claim based on the fact that gender was on the brain. You know, like we say, she, when she goes back and dealing with this in investigation, can either say the director of the lab withdrew this job offer because he had a gender stereotype that someone who was, he first talked to as a man should not become a woman, right? She could argue it that way. Or she doesn't even have to do that. She can just say, when he thought I was a guy, I, it was fine. And then when he found out I was a woman, it wasn't. I'm not even going to get into his brain. That's taking gender into account. That's gender on the brain. You have to prove that gender was taken into account. But this is one of the guys who was working on this said to me, we were talking, said, it's like, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Which I'd never heard that. He said, it's like that whole thing, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Who has ever heard that like joke, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Okay, some of you, okay. <laughs> I'd never heard it, so I was like, I don't know, General Grant? I mean, you know. I said, yeah, but it's that obvious. Okay, so that if gender's on the brain, right, if gender is clearly being taken into account, that's a violation of Title VII. So, that, so that's, that's the piece that I think we made more clear in terms of our legal analysis in Macy. You can get to it through gender stereotyping or you can get to it by if gender's on the brain. So the, the legal sort of thing is when an employer discriminates against someone because the person is transgender, the employer has engaged in disparate treatment, quote, related to the sex of the victim, quoting the Ninth Circuit case. This is true regardless of whether an employer discriminates against an employee because the individual has expressed his or her gender in a non-stereotypical fashion, because the employer is uncomfortable with the fact that the person has transitioned or is in the process of transi transitioning from one gender to another, or because the employer simply doesn't like that the person is identifying as a transgender person. In each of these circumstances, the employer is making a gender-based evaluation, thus violating the Supreme Court's admonition that, quote, an employer may not take gender into account in making an employment decision, end quote. See Price Waterhouse. Okay. So actually, the very last thing I will say before I turn it over is back on that thing of, oh my god, a new, new class of people that Congress didn't intend to cover, right? It's like, as we say this in the opinion, drawing on something that the district court uh, Judge Robertson said in the Schroer case. Let's say you had an employer that said, I'm fine about hiring Christians, I'm fine about hiring Jews, but, but Christians who convert to Judaism, ugh, I'm not, I don't want to hire those people. Okay. No one would argue that that's, not, that's discrimination based on religion. Right? It's not, we, we're now covering a new class of people, the class of people who were Christians and are now Jews. No. We are applying the words of the statute that say you may not discriminate because of religion. You may not discriminate because of race. You may not discriminate because of sex. That's the end all and be all. Hence I said, stunningly simple in a sense in terms of a matter of law, but in a way it just sometimes takes the world moving a bit for people to just sort of have their eyes open and say, oh my goodness. That's taking gender into account. That's a violation of Title VII. Okay, so now, in terms of how this will play out, I move to Melissa. I am going to talk about how the Macy decision 
um, is going to affect the federal sector, and I'm also going to talk about some of our sexual orientation cases that we've had recently. Um, but first, this decision ply, applies to all federal agencies. Um, so it's important now to know that gender identity discrimination is prohibited under Title VII sex discrimination prohibition, and all agencies must process transgender claims or gender identity claims under the 1614 process. Um, one of the things that we note in the decision is that it doesn't matter what terminology transgender individuals use when they file these claims. They could say that they believe they're being discriminated against on the basis of transgender status, gender identity, because they changed their sex, because of gender transitioning. These are all just different ways of saying that they were discriminated against on the basis of sex. Um, it's important for agencies from here on out to provide training to their staff, um, particularly EEO counselors. They're the first persons that um, complainants interact with. So it's important that all EEO counselors have updated training. Um, also, investigators. Our outreach and training division has updated all of their training to reflect these new laws. Um, so if you want to send your staff in for updates, that would be great. Um, it's important that counselors counsel the complainants to check off the sex box. Um, they can explain it later that it's gender identity, but it's important that they know that this is now covered under the basis of sex um, in Title VII. Um, also, it's, you should consider training, uh, offering your employees cultural competency training. Um, as these cases become more frequent, it's going to become apparent how employees just, they just don't know enough. Um, so it would be great if, if you tried to head off the EEO complaints in advance um, and offered some sort of cultural competency training. Um, another important suggestion that I would make is to read OPM's guidance regarding the employment of transgender individuals in the federal sector. This guidance is fantastic. It's on OPM's website and it discusses a lot of really important topics um, that affect transgender individuals. For example, it discusses things such as the general terms and concepts. Um, it gives a really great explanation of what the transition process might be like for a transgender individual. Um, again, the transition process is different for every transgender person, but this gives a really good understanding, basic understanding of what your transgender employees might be going through. Um, it discusses confidentiality and privacy. It discusses dress and appearance. It discusses names and pronouns, um, which is very important. It discusses the bathroom and locker use issues, which I know there's always lots of questions for those. Um, it discusses record keeping, and it discusses insurance benefits. So if you get a chance, please go and read that guidance on OPM's website. Um, there are other best practices that your agency can use, and I'm going to put our OEO director, Matt Murphy, on the spot right now, because um, I recently learned that in our internal policies, um, he has changed it so when we list sex as a basis in parentheses next to it, it's pregnancy, comma, gender identity. Am I correct, Matt? And I think that is excellent. That's not something that's required yet, but I think that's a best practice that agencies should consider using. Um, so that is how, in the foreseeable future, Macy will affect the federal sector. I'm sure that as we get more cases, there'll be more issues that come up. Um, but another topic that I wanted to discuss with you is our recent cases on sexual orientation that have come out of the federal sector. The first one we issued in July 2001, and the case was Veretto versus the United States Postal Service. Um, and this is nothing against the Postal Service. Both of our cases today we discuss just happens to be against the Postal Service. Um, in that case, the complainant alleged that he had been subjected to discrimination on the basis of his sex. He was a gay man, and he was harassed at work after it was announced in a newspaper that he was going to be marrying another man. The agency dismissed that complaint. Um, for failure to state a claim, and they found that complainant really was alleging discrimination on the basis of his sexual orientation. In our decision, we cited to the Supreme Court's decision in Price Waterhouse, and we found that this constituted a sex stereotyping claim that is prohibited by Title VII. 
Um, here, we found that the discrimination was based on the sexual stereotype that marrying a woman is an essential part of being a man. Um, we found that claims based on sexual orientation are typically claims of bias based on failure to conform to typical gender roles. Therefore, it's covered under Title VII. Um, here, the evidence showed the co complainant that the coworker became enraged when the complainant did not adhere to his stereotype um, that a man must marry a woman. And we found that this stated a claim under Title VII. Again, we didn't find discrimin discrimination on the merits in this claim. This is, we sent it back for further processing and an investigation. The next case is Costello versus United States Postal Service. And this case was issued in December 2011. Um, here, complainant was a lesbian, and she alleged, amongst other things, that her manager stated that she gets more pussy than the men in the building. Mom, if you're watching this, I'm so sorry <laughs> how to say that. I'm going to say it as, she got more sex. <laughs> <laughs> My mother would have preferred that. <laughs> um, in her complaint, she alleged discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and sex female. The agency dismissed the complaint for failure to state a claim, and they said that it does not fall under Title VII. We found that this stated a valid sex stereotyping claim under Title VII, and that the harassment was based on the belief that having a relationship with men is an essential part of being a woman. Now, both of these claims, it's important to note, have been based on the <coughs> sex stereotyping theory. Um, we have not yet made the leap that we made in Macy, um, finding that you can, you, transgender individuals aren't just bound by the sex stereotyping theory. Um, transgender individuals can allege any basis of sex discrimination, any theory that any other person can use when alleging sex discrimination. Um, so that is a distinction between the sexual orientation claims and Macy. Dan, do you want to talk about how this is going to affect the private sector? Sure. First, <laughs> w one other note taken off on something that Melissa said about changing agency policies to include gender identity in, in the sort of parenthetical after sex. We have a, a ringer in the audience, Sharon McGowan, who's <laughs> from DOJ uh, Appellate, and I know that she's been sort of looking at which agencies have actually done that, ha have, have made that change explicit. It's just one more indication for the public, I guess, or anyone looking at the policy about how obvious the law is in this regard. And I don't know, how, if, Sharon, if off the top of your head, you know how many agencies have actually done that now? Okay, so 12 and 15. So it's not just the EOC, Matt? Sorry, I just want to note, Sharon was also very instrumental in, oh. in our policy. You need a microphone. He said that Sharon was very instrumental in the EEOC's policy. Sharon also was uh, the lead counsel, I think, heavily involved in representing Diane Schroer, um, a landmark case in the District of, of Columbia. Anyway, I am kind of a novelty here because I'm not, at least presently, a federal sector person. How many people in the audience are here representing some agency in the federal sector? Is it pretty much everyone? Okay. Well, uh, who's not representing someone in the federal sector? Okay, okay, a few. <laughs> okay, well, I work in the EEOC's Office of General Counsel, and we deal with the private sector. We have very little to do with what happens in the federal sector. I work in the appellate services. Oh, was it too loud? Okay. It was echoing. I work in the Appellate Services Division of the Office of General Counsel, but what the Office of General Counsel does is represent the EEOC in the federal courts. So we actually end up bringing claims under Title VII against private employers. That have, uh, employers that have 15 or more employees. Um, so, and, and one of the main things we do is we bring our own claims. We bring claims where the commission is the plaintiff, but we also file amicus curiae briefs or friend of the court briefs in, uh, it's almost always in federal court, but we could also theoretically do it in state court as well. And the purposes of filing those amicus briefs include basically just trying to guide the court in the right direction in figuring out what the law is. Um, my, my group, the Appellate Services Division, that's a big chunk of what we do. And we have an elaborate system for looking at all of the district court cases that are coming out being decided across the country in federal district courts. And then looking at whether there's a pressing or novel or critical legal issue that will be going up to the courts of appeals. And 
Lucky for us, the federal rules of appellate procedure allow the EEOC, just as a matter of right, to file these amicus briefs in the federal courts of appeals. So we don't even need to get permission from the court to do that. However, we would need permission from the court to file an amicus brief at the district or trial court level. And I'm mentioning all this background because we did, back in October of last year, attempt to file an amicus brief. It was, and whenever the, we file an amicus brief, the, the position that the Office of General Counsel wants to take in the brief has to be approved by the full commission, including Commissioner Feldblum. Um, we got permission, the Office of General Counsel got permission from the commission back last October to file an amicus brief in uh, the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas in a transgender case. It was involving a, 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 a female, a male to female cashier who worked at this car dealership. And as soon as she announced uh, that she was intending to transition, she was fired. So we wanted to go in and file an amicus brief taking the position that under the reasoning in the Schroer case, which Commissioner Feldblum alluded to, that if you're, if you're changing your sex from male to female, it's just sort of like changing your religion, right, from being Christian to being Jewish, that therefore, almost per se, being discrimination based on one's transition is discrimination based on sex under Title VII. And we also wanted to argue in that amicus brief that uh, you, using the gender stereotyping theory as well, that if you're being discriminated against as a transgender person because you fail to conform to gender stereotypes, then that's obviously a violation of Title VII. So this was before Macy. So this was using basically what doctrines and what theories the courts had already recognized um, as to how transgender folks could, could bring these claims. Um, however, we tried to push the envelope just a little bit in this amicus brief that we attempted to file. And there was a footnote in the brief that the defendant filed a motion for summary judgment just basically saying, well, transgender individuals just aren't covered for being transgender under Title VII. And the defendant cited some early courts of appeals decisions that Commissioner Feldblum alluded to that had held as much. And the defendant, in its brief um, asking for summary judgment, made the argument that you know there's a difference between the classic gender stereotyping cases that, that, like what Price Waterhouse was about, and a claim being brought by someone who's transgender. Basically, the classic stereotyping case, according to the defendant, is just involving, uh, you know, c uh, presenting oneself or expressing oneself in ways that don't conform to maybe your birth sex. And we tried to make the argument in this footnote, in this Pacheco brief, that, well, actually, gender stereotyping is being read too narrowly by the defendant here. And this is what we sort of called, started to call the robust gender stereotyping theory, that when you think about it, all sort of discriminatory actions against transgender folks, and for that matter, against LGB folks, really, it, it, to most of us, seem to be rooted in stereotypes about how, one's, who, how one looks, how one lives their life, or even how, who one loves. That has to conform to stereotypical social norms that are rooted in your birth sex. So of course, if you're, if you're assigned the sex of male at birth, well, then you should act and appear like a man, not like a female. Similarly, you could argue that if you're assigned the male sex uh, at birth, well then obviously, and this is sort of what the Veretto and Castillo decisions were about, well then you should be only be attracted to someone who's female, not to someone who's male, not to the same sex as your birth sex, or not to both. Unfortunately, to make a long story short, we, as I mentioned, we have to get permission to file these amicus briefs in district court, and the district court refused our request to file this amicus brief, and it gave a couple of the reasons, but the one that I like to remember is that... I wanted a picture of your face right there. <laughs> Just when we're right here in the blue, it's like, really? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. The reason the court gave is that a couple days earlier, it had actually denied the defendant's motion for summary judgment and decided that there were genuine issues of dispute that had to go to a trial, so it was essentially moot for the court to have to consider EEOC's amicus position. The court also said, however, that it would have been troubled by accepting the EEOC's position in its amicus brief because previously the commission in its um, position as, as the investigator of this private sector charge, remember we're in the private sector, had no cause to the charge. 
meaning that our investigator had found that there was no reasonable cause to believe that a violation of Title VII had occurred. And the court's kind of scratching its head and saying, well, how can that be? So when you looked at this particular case when you were investigating the charge, you said, well, there's nothing here. And now you're coming into court sort of belatedly and telling us, no, no, there, there really is something here. And I won't go into all of the reasons why the court was, in our view, sort of wrong to go off on, on that grounds. But that does point up that there is actually a need for training here at the EEOC, which we're now doing a lot of, to get the word out that these, um, especially after the Macy decision, that we should be accepting these charges by individuals who are alleging gender identity or transgender discrimination, um, whether it's, it, it looks like it's gonna fall under, under a gender stereotyping theory or some other theory, at Macy has now made clear that the law is pretty obvious, at least with, with respect to trans folks, that they are covered, so we should not be no-causing these kinds of charges when they, when they come in our doors. Now, so, a couple other thoughts. The landscape is obviously um, getting better, especially for transgender folks. In the courts of appeals, and, and that's, again, where I primarily deal, there are, I think, now four or five courts of appeals that have explicitly recognized that transgender individuals can bring valid claims under Title VII. Um, although none have put it quite exactly how the commission has now put it in Macy. The landscape, the current landscape, I think for LGB folks is a lot more inhospitable. I think it's fair to say that. I, I'm not aware, and anyone in the audience or up here on the panel can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not aware of any federal court that has said that someone is covered under Title VII simply because of their sexual orientation. If they're discriminated against based on their sexual orientation per se, that they're covered under Title VII. Of course, a lot of courts have recognized that you could bring a gender stereotyping claim, and the fact that, you, just the mere fact that you happen to be gay or lesbian or bisexual doesn't mean that you're somehow kicked out of protection under Title VII. No matter what your sexual orientation, you can bring a, a cognizable Title VII claim. So if it's grounded in gender stereotyping, then obviously after Price Waterhouse, you, you, that claim should be cognizable under Title VII. Um, that said, our, the general counsel has now set up a work group, an LGBT work group, and the purpose of this work group is to advise the general counsel on how to make sure that LGBT individuals aren't being sort of unnecessarily carved out and that the protections are really be, being given f full force and effect uh, under the statutes that we enforce. And we're really, this work group, I'm a part of this work group, we're really trying to um, look at the law in all of the districts and all of the circuits around the country and find out um, where there may be areas where we can we can bring some of these cases and maybe um, maybe applying the Macy theory maybe not there's there's other theories out there as well that could be brought maybe a sex plus theory or an associational theory and we can talk about those in more detail if anyone has questions about them so I'm gonna just note that yesterday um, this LGBT work group was recognized by the chair um, during an award ceremony for their fantastic work that they've been doing so I just wanted to note that because I think that this work group has been doing great work Go ahead. And just a shout out, I always like to recognize the other work being done across the government. I know uh, DOJ, of which Sharon McGowan is a, is a part, also has an LGBT work group, and they're doing a lot of exciting stuff, too. So stay tuned. The law is sort of dramatically shifting under our feet, maybe not as quickly as some of us would like. Um, but, you know, stay tuned. We're going we're gonna to keep working in this area. And I'll just add one other thing um, in terms of the, the last piece that Daniel said in terms of sexual orientation, and then we're going to open for questions, um, that in fact um, a, number of, a number of courts have um, protected people who are gay, who are gender nonconforming, you know, through the sort of straight out Price Waterhouse analysis. There have been some courts, um, a, a district court that I just um, had read to me yesterday and I will be looking at it today, where the court actually said the gender stereotyping analysis applies even if the person is not um, stereotypically effeminate for a guy or butch for a woman. Okay, so again, it's not that the gender stereotyping applies only to the presentation piece of it. And that is the point. I mean, in, in terms of Veretto, I mean, again, we just had it jurisdictionally. It, th that was not a case that came up to the full commission. It was one that the Office of um, Federal Operations um, issued based on our, as the commission, delegating authority. But we have no idea whether this guy who put the marriage notice in the newspaper that he was getting married was effeminate or not. 
that wasn't the stereotype. The stereotype was you shouldn't be marrying a man, you should be marrying a woman. So there is, that's the sort of robust gender stereotyping theory that Daniel was talking about. As I noted, there's a way legally to not even have to deal with the whole gender stereotyping and just to say, well, clearly gender was being taken into account if you cared about the fact that you know, the, the person whom you were marrying was of a particular gender. Okay, it's sort of like if I always said I have my partner, my partner, and you thought my partner was a white guy, and then you found out he was a black guy, and then discriminated against me, obviously race was being taken into account, you know, without having to do any stereotyping analysis. So. I don't know if this was the, is this the case? This is Centola versus Potter, yeah, which is the, the District of Massachusetts, and the quote is, sexual orientation harassment is often if not always motivated by a desire to enforce gender norms. In fact, stereotypes about homosexuality are directly related to our stereotypes about the proper roles of men and women. So that's, again, sort of like Veretto and Castello right. notion. Right, and actually, it's worth giving that site because, so this is Centola, C-E-N-T-O-L-A versus Potter, 183 F Sup, 2nd, 403, District Court, Massachusetts, 2002. And in that opinion is another sentence that says, and you don't have to be, an yeah, effeminate yeah. man to take, uh, to have that um, protection against not um, being held to certain gender norms. Okay, with, I'll read the site again. It's 183 F SUP 2nd 403. From the, the District of, of Mass, it's Centola versus Potter. Sounds like another postal service case. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jolinda, are you moderating our questions? Yes, ma'am. So if you have a question, please step up. <coughs> Two thousand two, so it's actually quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, do you mind telling us just who you are? Is, is this on? Good question. It doesn't sound like it's on. Okay, my name is Peter Mueller. I'm uh, from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Thank you for the presentation today. I have four. I'm sorry, Peter. Our cart reporter can't hear you. So if you could step a little closer and speak a little louder. Uh, my name is Peter Mueller. I'm from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Thank you for your presentation today. I have four questions. Can I ask them all, or should ask I ask all them four, on? and okay. then we'll answer? Uh, first question: I would just like you to list citations for all the cases that you cited today. Uh, okay. The EEOC ones. Um, second question. Um, I've gotten the pretty clear message that if somebody, if a federal employee, this is all federal, uh, if a federal employee alleges discrimination on the basis of gender identity, that should be accepted. No magic words, accept it, you're making an error to dismiss it. I haven't quite heard that clarity of a message with regard to sex orientation, sexual orientation. I've heard two citations to cases where dismissals were overturned. I'd love to come back to my agency and say, say that the EEOC is telling us we must accept sexual orientation, but I want to know if I'm receiving that message. Mm -hmm. um, number three, um, just in line with the citations, also those early case citations, I'm really curious, any really, how, how far back were, were there actually cases that alleged gender identity? I thought that was this thing that was, just wouldn't have even come up. I mean, it mm -hmm. almost sounded like it might have been a 1970s or even mm -hmm. 60s case. That would be like pretty amazing, uh, just from the historical uh, context. And then last question, um, and this might sound a little bit a field, but one of one of those uh, EEOC uh, question uh, citations that were raised was a harassment case where an explicit comment was made um, to a lesbian. Um, what was going through my head is. If that was a one-time comment, the EEOC has dismissed harassment cases where very, very vulgar comments are made on all sorts of bases if it's a one-time isolated comment. And I'm just wondering, was that just a highlight of, ex of an extended pattern? Was the severe and pervasive test not even applied because maybe the dismissal was only based on sexual orientation? Or is that one comment not only protected on sexual orientation, but also severe and pervasive enough, standing alone, to cause a uh, hostile work environment. Okay. If I could jump in and answer the first question for all of you. Uh, the four cases that were highlighted, I think, mostly uh, by Melissa, but also by Commissioner Feldblum, have all been emailed to you, so you have the cases in your email box. And other <coughs> citations to other cases are all in the Macy decision. For example, those early cases, um, they tended to say transsexual, 
or transgender at the time as opposed to gender identity, but they were definitely that, that issue. Um, Can I just add on that? Um, in the courts of appeals, the cases, some of them were as early as the 70s, like the late 70s. A big one, for, I think it was from the Ninth Circuit, was in the late 70s, then another two that held that transgender folks were not covered. Those were in the early 80s. And the EEOC, I think, has case law also going back decades on, on this issue. Okay, why don't you answer the question, Melissa, in terms of the harassment piece? Um, because it was jurisdiction, I mean, so you'll answer that, and then I'll answer your, the question in terms of um, where to put sexual orientation claims, although you might want to say something about that as well. Okay. Um, as far as this particular case, we didn't decide whether this one comment was severe or pervasive enough. Um, we were just deciding whether a claim of sex stereotyping such as this stated a claim under Title VII. I can't say whether or not we would find a, a, a statement just like this is severe or pervasive enough. Usually um, that hinges on the N-word. Maybe if the F-word was in there, um, that might be in a similar vein. Um, but here, there were um, other allegations, but this is the one that was prevalent and the one that really established that this manager was acting with a stereotype that she should be dating men. Um, yeah, I, I think probably also the stereotype was she shouldn't be taking other women away from us. You know? right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, <laughs> I thought when I read it, but um, so on the on the question, um, yes, I think the fact that, and, and for those of you who are in the federal sector, know this. For those of you who might be watching this or don't know as much about the federal sector, let me just explain that we get you know something like four thousand cases. Um, the federal sector will issue the, our office of federal operations will issue. So obviously, five commissioners are not looking at four thousand cases. It just doesn't happen. That's why we have stat statutorily, the commission is supposed to issue orders and, and provide non-discrimination protection. We as a commission have delegated that authority to our Office of Federal Operations, where we have lots of wonderful writing attorneys like Melissa who work on these cases. There are a select number of cases that come up to the full commission for a vote, anywhere from 30 to 50 over the course of the year. And that's based on various criteria that the commission has worked out with its Office of Federal Operations. Macy was one of those that came up to the full commission. That's why it's a vote of the full commission. That's why it is precedential in terms of saying to an agency, you must because the commission has voted. My suggestion to agencies, though, is if anyone, and this is what the counselors should be told, is if a gay person comes forward and says, I've been discriminated because I'm gay, based on at least two decisions that our Office of Federal Operations has issued, clearly that person should be able to go through the 1614 process if they can show that there was some stereotype, there was some stereotype that they should be acting in the way men or women should act. Or, and this is simply an application of the you can't have gender on the brain analysis for Macy, to say, hey, I think it's going to be smarter to let this person go through the regular 1614 process. Okay, now, if you if you're an agency that has some alternative process set up, it's not that the person can't go to that voluntarily if they want to, but you know, to me, a better, just simple application of the law would be to allow that person to go through the 1614 um, process. Because based on what the commission has ruled as a matter of law in Macy, and what it's done in at least two cases from the Office of Federal Operations, we would be expecting to be seeing these cases. And the same thing in terms of for our investigators. Okay, if someone comes into an EOC office and says, I was discriminated against because I was gay, they have to get out of their med mindset of, oh, we don't cover gay people here, right? Which has sort of been the idea to say, oh, wait a second. I think I need to take this charge, have you check sex, and now let's see whether gender was at issue in what was going on with you. So again, and at some point, one of these things will come up to the commission for a full vote, which is as not as yet. Before we move to the next question, I just want to make sure uh, everyone understands what the commissioner said. And Dan mentioned this, and I'm going to ask him to repeat what he was explaining as the robust, robust position that we took in the Pacheco brief. 
as to why we recommend that the prudent uh, path for you to take with th these initial uh, contacts that come in is to send it forward to the commission to make further decision. Uh, if you could explain again well, yeah, what I mean, that stereotyping theory is. It, it basically is that stereotyping is not just about how you look or how you present yourself or your mannerisms. That sort of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation inherently, inevitably, is grounded in the notion that the person that you're harassing or discriminating against because they're gay or lesbian or bisexual, that that victim, that person, doesn't adhere to the norm that you want them to adhere to, which is if you're born a man, then you should be attracted only to women, right? That's sort of the prevailing cultural norm and things may be changing. But so if you're, in almost, it's, uh, in my mind, it's impossible to imagine a case where you are discriminating against someone who is lesbian, gay, or bisexual because they're lesbian, gay, or bisexual. That does not involve a stereotype about who so the person who's lesbian, gay, or bisexual should love or be attracted to. It's that simple. And the same thing, of course. Daniel with is in love with a very lovely woman named Amber. <laughs> so he fits his, uh, I'm in love with a very lovely woman who's a woman. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. My name is Lola Hetrick. I'm going to need Andrew you to step Mike. closer to the mic. My name is Lola Hetrick Capers, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of Civil Rights. And my question At which agency? Um, Department of Interior. Mm -hmm. And um, my questions kind of touch on the issues that you raised. Because at the Department of Interior, we've had a uh, regulation governing processing of discrimination complaints for um, gay, lesbians, transsexuals that basically covered um, their discrimination complaints. Um, but we also, in addition, they could get a final agency decision without um, appeal rights to the EEOC. But they also had a, a process where they could go and have a full-blown hearing before our Department of Interior's hearing and appeals office. Uh, but right now we're changing that to eliminate the option of hearing and appeal. So we are in the process of drafting the new regulation. But with this um, Macy case came up, the issue is should we not refer to um, transgenders in our internal regulations and just put it under the section 1614 regulations? That's one issue. But then I was talking to the solicitor this morning, uh, trying to hammer out the um, final language, and she was basically saying, what the heck? Why shouldn't we just um, go along with the Cole case and let everything go through the section uh, 1614 um, procedures? Because we think it's going mm -hmm. to be confusing to the um, potential complainants if we have two different regulations. And I don't, I'm not, um, don't think that our counselors and investigators will kind of be able to make the distinction also. So I was wondering, what do you recommend? Um, well, I'll tell you what I recommend and then you can also, I, I think your solicitor has it right on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, like I said, if, there was a reason why agencies were setting up those whole separate procedures because it didn't seem as if there was robust coverage under Title VII. I think what the Macy decision is saying is there is robust uh, protection under Title VII. Instead of confusing counselors and stuff with two different you know, procedures, everything should just be coming through the 1614 process. And we therefore just give appeal rights to the EEOC. And give appeal rights to the EEOC, exactly. So then you're just treating that person just like anyone else, bringing a regular, any other sort of sex discrimination complaint. And that the other thing becomes sort of an appendix, you know, appendix as in it's or, you know, not necessary anymore. Um, and everything goes through the 1614 process. Um, that, that would be my recommendation. I, that's M Melissa. And I, I would agree with that. Um, I do think that streamlining the process would be good. And if you give them appeal rights and it's something that shouldn't be come before the commission, we'll work that out on appeal. Oh, exactly. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> that may be one of the cases that comes up to the full commission. Hi, I'm Jessica Hughes. 
Um, Closer, I'm, please. I'm an EEO manager at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And um, I have two questions, and this relates to the um, first the amicus brief in Pacheco, this idea that if the EEOC originally found no cause, why are you now saying this? And that is, there's currently an executive order in place protecting mm -hmm. against discrimination from sexual orientation. And it seems to me that this EEOC position of robust coverage, that all of this is based on gender on the brain, is somewhat undermined by saying you have to have a separate executive order to protect against sexual orientation, at least in the federal workplace. Because why would you need that if Title VII really does cover those claims? And second, um, going along with this in terms of establishing whether a prima facie case has been made if I'm writing a final agency decision, it would seem to me under this gender stereotyping thing that one of the elements would have to be demonstration in the record that a decision maker or a coworker if it's a harassment knew about the sexual orientation. Obviously, if someone puts a marriage announcement in the paper that he's marrying another man, that would do it. But if you have someone who doesn't announce their sexual orientation, it's not like their race or their, their, you know, what their sex is, you really could defeat that saying, I had no idea she went home to a woman. I mean, she could have gone home to a dog, a cat, a man, I didn't know. And that, to me, would then be sufficient to defeat any inference that the decision would be made on that. So I don't know if there's any further guidance on what would be your prima facie case of this kind of stereotyping. Like, what would you have to show as a complainant to um, make your case. Thank you. Well, okay, did you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I'll take the second question first. I mean, in some respects, nothing that the commission has said recently changes sort of methods of proof and the McDonnell Douglas framework and all that. But you may recall, if, if you write a lot of these decisions, that the McDonnell Douglas framework, especially the prima facie case part, is, you know, courts have said this over and over. It's not supposed to be rigid or mechanistic. And sort of the catch all prong, you can make out a prima facie case with any evidence that raises an inference of discrimination. So you don't even need a comparator necessarily. So, of course, if you have uh, affirmative evidence that someone was being discriminated against because of their sexual orientation and therefore because of that kind of robust stereotype type that they should be um, attracted only to people of the opposite sex, that's going to be enough to make out a prima facie case. But if you have no evidence that sexual orientation had anything to do with the decision, it would be sort of like somebody who's claiming that they were discriminated against because of their religion when there's no evidence that, that the employer knew what their religion even was, or that they had engaged in protected activity and were retaliated against when the decision maker had no idea that they had even engaged in protected activity. So in some respects, this isn't, this isn't really sort of new territory. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, it, obviously, if you're going to be arguing that it was because of sexual orientation, there has to be something that shows that the person knew that you were gay, lesbian, bisexual. Um, on the question of the executive order, I think this is just sort of how the historical arc goes. Um, I think that um, because the courts were not initially receptive to understanding how it is gender on the brain, right, when you're dealing with a transgender person or a lesbian, gay, bisexual person, there was the perceived need of having a separate executive order. Um, I think there's still, you know, from my perspective, um, as someone who helped work on the Employment and Discrimination Act for many years, there's still a utility in having a explicit statement that sexual orientation and gender identity are covered. Um, just because, you know, we're just starting here from the EOC. Our job is to apply the law as written. That's in our investigations. That's in our dealing with federal agencies. You know, but at some point, we'll bring some cases in court, and some courts will agree with us, and others will say, no, I don't agree. So, you know, until the Supreme Court agrees with our analysis of Title VII, you know, that uh, it's not determinative for everyone. And so there's always some utility in having, whether it's an executive order or a piece of legislation that says it clearly. And then you just end up, for a certain period of time, you're just going to have dual coverage, coverage from different perspectives. But the executive order, of course, didn't give the access to the EOC process and the Title VII process and the remedies of that that the 1614 process does. And just for clarification purposes, the executive order still stands, which is why lots of agencies have dual processes. They have an internal process. Nothing in Macy speaks to that, doesn't say that you should stop doing that. Uh, I think they've talked about you know, what you might do if someone asks a question as to where I should go. But in the event that someone comes forward and says, I want to go through your internal process, you have it there for a reason. 
Hi, my name is Patrick Depoy, and I'm with the American Civil Liberties Union. I'm also one of those people that raise their hand when asked if they're not in the federal <laughs> Um I think you kind of answered my uh, question, Commissioner, in that federal district courts and appellate courts are not required to follow Macy versus Holder in the private sector or state and local government context. No, I mean, a court is not required to follow our opinions. Um, they do, however, look to our regulations, our guidance, our opinions as persuasive authority. I mean, as putting on my administrative law <laughs> professor hat, you know, this is the classic Skidmore deference. That is, you give deference to an agency who's, I mean, we start with some level of deference because we are the agency that is empowered by Congress to implement and enforce the law. So we start with that level of deference from the courts. And then what they'll do is look at our analysis and look at our reasoning. And if that's persuasive to them, that gets like added. That's the little whipped cream on top, you know, of the Skidmore <laughs> deference. So, you know, my, again, from my perspective, um, this is basically pretty simple in terms of what sex means, you know, in terms of not having it and giving some shout outs that. Daniel Vale actually served as a, in a detail in my office for three to four months. Um, and another attorney from OGC, Eric Carrington, served. So I, you know, there were some fantastic uh, appellate lawyers looking at this, obviously the whole Office of Federal Operations. Um, you know, I think it's persuasive reasoning. We'll see if the rest <laughs> of the courts do. I mean, but again, you know, we were building on various court decisions. This is how the dynamic goes. It's like we were looking at court decisions and making our decision. I think courts will be looking at our decision to make their decision, and then sort of the cycle continues. Is this the Lion King movie? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, and just a, just a quick follow-up question for Dan. You mentioned that when you were trying to Can you speak that, closer into the mic? Yeah, sorry Thank about you. that. When you uh, mentioned submitting that amicus curiae brief um, that would have expanded and kind of used uh, a robust gender stereotyping argument, um, it wasn't accepted. Is there an opportunity um, that the full commission might see to see to take on one of those cases and apply robust gender stereotyping theories to to uh, LG, LGB employees that are experiencing discrimination based on orientation? rather than gender identity. Well, this goes back again to sort of the work of our LGBT work group in the Office of General Counsel. And one of the things that we're sort of tasked with doing and that we're starting to do is to try and find cases where we can sort of bring appropriate claims and, and maybe raise some of these arguments in, in the private sector. I certainly personally can't commit the commission to filing a case like that. The, our general counsel would have to agree with the position um, given the particular facts of the particular case. And if it's an amicus brief, then of course the commission would also have to approve it. But there are strands of that robust gender stereotyping theory in the Macy decision as well. So there's obviously, and, and the Pacheco brief that was approved. So there's precedent for, you know, in a, in a future potential amicus case for the commission to vote that way. Thank you. I just had a question that I happened to think about when you all were. Can you just tell us your name and Oh, name Ashley Laverta Tillman. I work for the Department of Defense. And so I happened to think about cross-dressing, and we hadn't heard that necessarily in your discussion this morning. But, um, and I guess I'm just looking for a confirmation. You talked a lot about training and what we should be advising people. We try to provide a lot of guidance about how people should be treated. And then um, we also get a lot of questions about um, standards for dress in the workplace. And so I just want a kind of confirmation from you. I'm thinking that your guidance would be um, much more, uh, or what the guidance that we sh as federal um, agencies should be provide to employees and managers is more of a general sense in terms of what people can wear. So if there's an expectation that people are professionally dressed, you know, you can wear sh suits, closed-toed shoes, you know, so it's not, you know, women in skirts, you know, men in pants, that kind of thing. And so I just wanted confirmation. And then um, also for, um, I, 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 I want to share, but maybe not too much, but sometimes I guess there's been guidance given about when people can wear certain things. And I think, again, that's probably going to be more of a general um, sense, you know. So maybe, maybe, guides, maybe sometimes agencies are given guidance, well, you know, when you're in this environment, th this is how you need to dress, where really it's probably going to be more across the board. So I just want to see if you all had some discussions about those types of issues. Sure, I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, OPM has addresses this in their guidance that I mentioned before, the guidance regarding employment of transgender individuals in the federal workplace. Um, and one of the things that they talk about here is that one of the stages 
of a transgender person's transition is they begin to live and work full time um, in the target gender, in the gender that they're transitioning to. And that includes dressing in that gender. Um, as an employer under this guidance, you should allow the transgender individual to dress um, as the gender that they now identify with. With that said, they still have to comply with the agency's dress codes. So if an agency has a dress code that says no women may wear open-toed shoes for safety reasons, that also applies to transgender women. Um, however, if your women in your workforce are allowed to wear skirts, you cannot tell a transgender woman that they can only wear pants. They have to be allowed to dress as a woman in skirts as well, um, as long as that's not in violation of the dress code. Yeah, and let me, I'll just add to that in terms of reading this, because this is part of the, um, sort of the cultural competence that Melissa referred to, and EOC um, has uh, done three I classes. Um, where people called in on cultural competency around transgender and sexual orientation. Um, and, and a brown bag. What? And, and a brown bag on this. So, but so on the dress and appearance, what the OPM guidance says is employees who begin, quote, the real life experience, end quote, stage of their transition, and they've explained before sort of how transition operates, are required under medical standards of care to live and work full time in the target gender in all aspects of their life, which includes dressing at all times in the clothes of the target gender. Once an employee has informed management that he or she is transitioning, the employee will begin wearing the clothes associated with the gender to which the person is transitioning. Agency dress codes should be applied to employees transitioning to a different gender in the same way that they are applied to other employees of that gender. Dress codes should not be used to prevent a transgender employee from living full time in the role consistent with his or her gender identity. And so what this means in practice is that when someone finally makes the decision to transition, there is a point in time when they are now in the real life experience of transitioning. And there'll be different levels of medical stuff that may go along with that. That'll be completely between that person and his or her medical provider. Okay? But that person knows when he or she is now entering the real life experience of living as the other gender. At that point, what you as the employer need to think of is that person is now a woman. If that person is trans, and so whatever you would demand of a woman, that's what you're demanding. And if it's no open, you know, like the sandals I'm wearing right now, you know, <laughs> That's the rule. What, what you can't do is say, oh, but that looks sort of weird or funny, and I want you to still be looking like a man you know, for this period of time and go with our dress codes for men. That's what's not OK. So once the person starts that real life experience of transitioning, they have to be in that gender. And again, let me tell you, medically, it's not that they're flipping back and forth and stuff. They are now living as that gender. Yes. Right, and I guess that would also apply. We have folks who aren't just closer. Who, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. We have folks who are just, you know, cross dress generally, so they aren't transitioning. So the same. No, no, know, no. So this is the thing. So under the case law, which I have sort of thoughts about, but under the case law, dress codes are permitted. You can say all the men here are going to wear, you know, this type of uniform, and the women are going to be wearing this type of uniform. That's our dress code. So long as it's not stereotypical and that women can't wear pants, you know, and yeah. But you can have dress codes. And and the courts have upheld that and EOC has not said that that is uh, discrimination based on sex. You know, it's just that whatever those dress codes are, you get you have to be treating the person in the gender that they are. But but actually, I mean, I don't know if well, I want to I, say anything different. Ms. McGowan in the audience, but uh, okay. Just to clarify, was your question really if you have someone whose gender identity is female, but they were born male, but they're only occasionally uh, um, expressing themselves as female in the workplace, as you call it, cross-dressing, then? Just cross-dressing generally, so not transitioning, just okay. in, in presenting to work. You know, maybe one day this individual dresses for example, a man dressing as a woman and then 
two or three days out of the week he dresses as a man. So, I mean, not transitioning though. So that now, now got a little bit of confusion, but. Um, you know what, that is actually an interesting legal question under Title VII. When I think about it a bit more, it's actually not addressed by this Macy decision. Mm -hmm. So okay. before we move on to or, or by the OPM guidance, right. which really um, did not take on that question. Before we move on to the next question, uh, in answer to the question percolating of where can I find the OPM guidance, you can go to www.opm.gov search box, type in transgender. It's the first thing that comes up. Uh, second uh, point of information. EEOC actually conducted a brown bag with uh, members of advocacy, advocacy groups for transgendered individuals uh, roughly two years ago. That brown bag was recorded. It's available on our website. A lot of the typical questions that you get, typical meaning bathrooms, lockers, showers, those are the questions that come up most often. We spent quite a bit of time talking about them uh, and answering those questions. So you can go to EEOC's website. Again, search box, type in transgender. It's the first thing that comes up. Up, and it's a video that you can actually uh, watch that brown bag. And then third item, I just want to put in a plug, uh, since our panel has so kindly set me up for this, uh, you've mentioned uh, cultural competency with regard to LGBT issues. Uh, at this year's EEOC Excel conference, we will be having uh, both Commissioner Feldblum talk about Macy extensively and just the evolution of Title VII overall, but we're also going to have a separate uh, session on cultural competency, LGBT issues provided by uh, the lead trainer from an organization called Out and Equal out in uh, San Francisco. So we will be offering that if you would like to join us in Dallas, where it will be warm. <laughs> July 31st, August 1st. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm Stephen Quezon, Federal Bureau of Prisons. When we investigate the sexual orientation, uh, robust uh, gender stereotyping cases, we uh, want to do it in a sensitive way. For example, comparators may want to keep their orientation secret. We're not going to drag them out. On the other hand, I know you provided guidance probably to your investigators on how to, what the best practices are, or maybe the work group will, so we can benefit from that. Okay. Sure. That's a very good point. Right, I mean, I think um, guidance, both obviously to the federal agencies, to our investigators, all of this is uh, things that we've been hearing, you know, would be helpful. What we try to do is um, note the guidance that already exists, for example, like OPMs, and um, OPM might have actually some stuff as well in terms of sexual orientation, I believe, but obviously that's something that we've been, been asked for. Any other questions before we close? Okay, if you will indulge us please before you leave, we have a special presentation that we would like to make, so I'm gonna invite Melissa Brand up to the podium. And thank you for your attention and conversation. So one of the other hats that I wear here is I am the president of EEOC Pride, which is the EEOC's LGBT employee group for LGBT employees, friends, and allies. Um, we have a board of nine members, and if you're on the board and in the room, would you mind coming up here with me? Because this is by far more than just me. This is a group effort. I know, I'm putting you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> um, and we have members in our offices all across the country. And one of the things that we did this year is we created the EEOC Pride Award. Um, and the EEOC Pride Award is an award that we're gonna give out annually to an EEOC employee to recognize their significant contributions to the LGBT community. And it was a very easy decision of who should receive our very first EEOC Pride Award. Um, this year, we've decided that the very first award should go to Commissioner Feldblum. Uh, <laughs> it would be impossible for me to sit up here and try to summarize and encapsulate all of the reasons why she's the perfect recipient for our very first award. Um, she's not only our very first openly gay commissioner, but she's also one of the lead drafters of ENDA, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which has been winding its way through Congress, um, which would give federal protection to LGBT individuals in the workplace. 
Um, she also began fighting against discrimination um, for HIV and AIDS during a time when many of our nation's leaders weren't even acknowledging that HIV and AIDS was an issue. She has been working magic within the commission and has been a driving force behind a lot of our advancements, such as the Macy decision um, and the Pacheco brief. She is a strong supporter of our employee group, and many of our members attribute their comfort with being out in the workplace to her. <laughs> um, she's a trailblazer and she's a steady champion, not just for LGBT issues, but for workplace issues in general. And yesterday, when I was speaking to someone about Commissioner Feldblum, he mentioned that people like her let our children know that it is OK to be different and that there's people out there who will be fighting for them. Mm -hmm. And so on behalf of EEOC Pride and all of its members, it's with great honor that I give Commissioner Feldblum our very first EEOC Pride Award and announce that henceforth, this award will be referred to each year when we give it out as the EEOC Pride High Feldblum Award. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, they, they did tell me they were going to do this, and then I just it went out of my head. But let me tell you, I think, you know, for, for there are groups, and you come from agencies, I mean, Interior, Transportation, Justice, I mean, They've been having robust LGBT employee groups for years. And EOC, I, I did learn that there was like a, one that sort of started a bunch of years ago and then petered out. And so this one really just started a, a year and a half ago. Um, and I, you know, I think for the agency that is responsible for enforcing civil rights across the country, it's fantastic to have this type of employee group. But even more importantly, the last thing that Melissa said, you know, I often say, I just said it two days ago at a speech, equality doesn't just mean treating people the same, right? Because sometimes treating people the same is exactly what you want to do. And especially when prejudice is rampant, and you can imagine in the 60s and people are trying to implement the law, you could say to managers, treat everyone the same everyone the same because that way whatever prejudice may, they might have against a black person or Hispanic person, you know, that'll be the way to cure that. So sometimes equality is about treating people the same. But really equality is about treating people as equals with equal dignity and respect. And sometimes that doesn't mean treating them the same because we're not all the same to begin with. You know, if you have a neutral rule that says no one can eat at their desks, we're going to treat everyone the same, someone with diabetes who needs to eat won't be able to have that job. Right? If you have a rule that says no, uh, no, headgear, no headgear at all, we don't want anyone with different competing baseball hats. Okay, well, if you're a Sikh and you wear a turban or an Orthodox Jew and you wear a, a yarmulke, you're not being treated the same because you can't do that job if you can't wear that headgear. We're not all the same to begin with. And I will tell you, we have come so far in terms of LGBT rights, in terms of people realizing that the love is the same between people. But the, whole, the rest of the world isn't set up yet to actually accommodate that. And what we're doing now, all of us in our bits and ways, is just moving forward our country to a place where equality really is that we are treating people with equal dignity and respect. And so with that, I'm thrilled to have this award from you guys. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. That concludes our program. Please join me in giving a round of applause to our panelists for what I think was an inspiring soundback. As I mentioned at the, at the top of the hour, we emailed out all of the briefs to folks that were mentioned here. If you didn't RSVP and just showed up, you probably won't get an email, so send an email back to us and we will make sure you get it. And with that, have a good afternoon. Thank you, Julinda. Thank you.